Hi friends, Josh from the Narrate team here. For our Christmas Eve gatherings, Adam reflected on the original Christmas story as told in the Gospel of Matthew. Adam talked about how the plans of Joseph and Mary were drastically interrupted and how they managed themselves through those developments and changes. Christmas Eve started for Narrate a series titled Merge, which will be a conversation on balancing willingness with being surrendered. You, you know, you know, among among my among my favorite things about the Christmas story is is the similarity of their stories to ours. I mean, here we are, over two thousand years removed, on a completely different continent with a completely different economy and a completely different kind of moral code, and yet our stories are so similar. I mean, think of think of how the story started. You have two very young, very ambitious, very vision minded, very aggressive uh, these, if not idealistic, teenagers who have a very clear design on their future. They're going places. They want things. They're like Lewis and Clark. Right? Like they're going there. But then it happens. There's an interruption. There's a disruption. There's something entirely out of their control. They couldn't have planned for it. They can't be blamed for it. There's nothing they could have done to have seen it coming, but they have to deal with it. I mean, tell me that's not your story. You know, you, you, you got the degree, and then you learned there weren't any jobs with that degree. You, you got the degree, you, you, you married the gal, you had the kid, you, you moved to the town, you got on the team, you, you made the school... Like you started the business, you got the new job, but then it happened. He lied. She cheated. There was a diagnosis. There there was an addiction. Uh, The market shifted. Uh, The company failed. Something entirely out of your out of your control happened. I mean, it's just, it's just not your story. It, it, all of this, it, it reminds me of my friend Jack. Many of you will know Jack Overweiser. He's a legendary professor at Carroll College, kind of a salt of the earth kind of guy who, like many of you, has given his life to serving God and people. Uh, but for Jack, more recently, what that's looked like is not just serving students on the campus at Carroll, but also taking them all over the world, introducing them to a life that's not about themselves and introducing them to third world poverty. And what I love about Jack is, is he's like most heroes, from 30,000 feet, he has all the makings of a hero. But when you get up close to him, he, he's, he's broken like you and I are broken. He, he's got the same challenges and the same insecurities and the same fears. And what I know of Jack from our friendship is that Jack doesn't really like to travel, which is ironic because he's spent a lot of time taking kids to students all over the world. And so this summer, I knew that he was going to Africa. So there's like travel and then there's Africa, right? And I knew he was nervous and trying to be a good friend. I knew the day he was set to return and I texted him. I was like, hey, Jack, we should get together. I'd love to hear about your trip. And he said, actually, I'm not home yet. I'm still in Washington, D.C. And then he said, but I got arrested in Amsterdam. <laughs> well, that's a cliffhanger. So it was the following Sunday. You know, I got to say hi to Jack and we were scheduling a time to get together and talk. And I said, but okay, I can't wait until we meet to hear how in the world did you get arrested on the streets of Amsterdam? And he's like, no, no, it wasn't the streets. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, I was at the market in Africa and I bought this like 24 inch wooden statue carving thingamajig for my wife, you know, something to put on your mantle, pretty, pretty innocuous kind of purchase, shoved it in my backpack, didn't think much of it, got to the airport, went through security, put the backpack on the belt, got the backpack, uh, the, the security took the backpack off the belt, grabbed the statue, kind of turned it around and looked at it and examined it. So at the time, I thought nothing of it. Shoved it back in the backpack. I put the backpack on, went about my merry way. Flight landed in Amsterdam. Amsterdam had to go back through security. Once again, through the backpack on the belt. Backpack went through uh, the, the, the x-ray machine. Backpack came off the belt. Security guy had the statue in his hand, was examining it from several angles. And he said, but they were a little more studious. And he said, he started like grabbing the, the head of this man in this wooden carving statue. And he said, finally, I watched him and he turned it and he pulled it out, and it turned out it wasn't just a head. It was a, it was a handle to a 22-inch knife. <laughs> so together we learned that wasn't just a head. It was a handle. <laughs> and the man looked at him and said, Sir, that's a crime. You're under arrest. You'll miss your flight. And so they hauled him off, and I'm sure it's more dramatic in our heads than it really was, but I picture, don't you just picture, like, the single light bulb, and it's kind of flickering because it hasn't had an electrician in 200 years, and here he is sitting in this room. He said, Adam, I was about to barf. He struggles with anxiety like many of you. He said, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. Finally, the guy looked at me and said, you didn't mean to do this, did you? He said, no. And they said, well, how about you just leave it with us? And he said, deal. <laughs> but tell me that's, that's not your story. 
In fact, uh, we could be cynical, couldn't we? Because it's, it's not if something's going to go wrong, it's, it's when. And yet I wonder, despite what we know intellectually, despite what we know academically, despite what we know in the safe confines of the Helena Civic Center, I wonder if our lives reflect that. I wonder how many of you are like me, who if you were to be honest, despite what you know, you live over here. And you are bound and determined to control everything. And I wonder for how many of you, uh, people say behind your back what they say behind mine. He's a control freak. And I, listen, I, I don't want to trivialize clinical depression or anxiety. I wonder for how many of you, you your, your body is sick with anxiety. Because you are terrified of those things you can't control. You, you know things are going to happen, but you've set out in business and relationship to make sure they don't. I wonder for, for how many of the, there's not just anxiety and, and fear, but if you really live here, you're a lonely person. Why? Because, because we can control our kids for a season, but not forever. And people don't like to be controlled. Numbers do. And slowly but surely, people leave your life. And then there's this, this other quadrant. Uh, some of you, perhaps, you've, you've quit. And it's not that you're trying to control everything. You're trying to control nothing. And maybe it's clinical depression, maybe it's not, but nonetheless, you're a victim. In fact, you can't stand to see other people succeed because you didn't, your marriage didn't, your business didn't, your health hasn't. And probably you're bitter, certainly you're jaded and cynical, and sadly, you're probably just as lonely because healthy people don't hang around negative people. Toxic people do, but not, not thriving ones. And I guess the question that I want to pose to us this morning is, what what if part of the gift of Christmas is a God who in his grace comes alongside Emmanuel and says, let me teach you how to merge these two things. Not neither, not, not just one or the other, but both. What if healthy people, joyous people, people who make an impact, people who fulfill their desires for purpose to contribute to the common good, to be connected to God beyond their wildest imagination, what if what they learn to do is not to never have plans, and of course they have plans, and not to hope for bad things to happen, of course they don't, but to merge those two things. You know, Mary and Joseph, their, their story, the part of it we know is it's, it's this one over here. The part about riding on a donkey and giving birth to the Messiah, the part about that Messiah being the King of Israel, the part about Jesus, the Messiah, completely reinvigorating our understanding of God and who he is and what he likes and and what he wants from us, that the part of Jesus, that the the part of the story that gives birth to the Messiah who would go to the cross and and pay all of our penalty for for our own garbage, that the one who would walk out of the tomb, mostly uncelebrated at the time, nobody was standing out there going 10, 9, 8, like it was, he was alone, but he was victorious. That's the part of the story we know. But I guess, here's what's been messing with me. Can we appreciate that this part of the story was only made possible because they merged these two aspects of the story? That they, like you, they wanted things. And then they had to adjust. And though it might sound trite, they ended up with something far different, far less predictable, and far more impactful than anything they went looking for. For just a moment, I promise, we're going to let the band come back out, because I know that's why you're here. (laughs) That's why I'm here. I guess the question I want to ask is, how are you at merging? See, the hard thing about merging is it's not one thing, it's two. Can you do that, like tap on your head, do that thing? I can't do it. I can't even clap and sing at the same time. Merging requires two simultaneous skills, doesn't it? Because you have to be ambitious, you have to have drive, you have to want things, you have to have designs for the future. And Mary and Joseph, they they were like that. These, These were not two teenagers sitting on the porch waiting for God to show up and give them something to do. These were two ambitious people with strong opinions about God and their future and their retirement and what they were gonna drive. They had lots of plans, it's all over the story. They were willful. And in fact, every story in God, every person in God's story has been willful. Sarah and and Esther and Naomi and Ruth and Abraham and Noah and Moses, the disciples, they didn't always get it right, but they always had a bias for action. Remember, Jesus, the type of followers he picked, weren't the ones who sat around and read books, though they probably did that too, but they're also the ones who did something. And and when Jesus said, hey, I got to die on the cross, they had the audacity to pull him inside and go, you're stupid, you can't die on the cross. They, They were willing to get it way wrong, but they weren't willing to not be willful. 
They, they were people, these Joseph and Mary, who, who wanted things. And you know something? This type of character is celebrated over and over again in the text. Listen to Proverbs chapter 6. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard. That's exactly what you thought you were going to think about this morning, isn't it? It's ants. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. What can we learn from the ant? Well, first of all, that women do the heavy lifting in our society. Just, just saying. What do we learn? Have you ever seen an ant sitting around? Ever just seen one parked? Ever, ever seen one not moving? No, they're, they're these crit- creatures who always have a plan, and it might not always be the right one, but they're always going to have one. And listen to what they contrast the ant with. I mean, you thought you didn't want to be an ant, but here's the alternative. How, how long will you lie there, you slug? When will you get up from your sleep? So we've got the contrast of this bias for action versus this nothingness. Uh, the, the, the Proverbs also in, in chapter 13 says it this way, a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Mary and Joseph were willful, but they also embraced a life that would have things happen to them that were outside of their control. They were surrendered. They understood that sometimes they would have to merge what they wanted with what they were given, what they wanted with what God wanted. Listen to Proverbs chapter 16. Commit, oh wait, sorry, I wanted to go to Matthew 1 first. Listen to this, sorry Mick, I'm making you jump around. He's the guy behind the slides if you think I'm crazy and talking to thin air. Uh, so so here, here, here we go, Matthew chapter 1, listen to Joseph. But after he had confessed this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The hymn is Joseph. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 24, when Jace, Joseph woke up, He did what the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. He had plans. He also got married. He also figured he'd live to 80. He also figured the business would be successful. He also, he also, he also. And God showed up. Circumstances happened. And he had to merge. He he was also surrendered, is the word that I've been using with myself. Listen now to Proverbs 16. In Proverbs 16, we see, and in Proverbs is this relatively neutral form of wisdom in the text that is not promises, it's just observations. Listen to 16.3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plan. Does it say don't have a plan or make plans to merge yours with another one? In their hearts, human plan their, humans plan their course, but the Lord, he establishes their steps. Or or listen to 21. I know this one's relevant because we all have horses at home. Listen to this. Uh, The the horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. See, Mary and Joseph, they, they, they were very willful. But what if they were also very surrendered? And you know something, if Christmas gives us this example of what it looks like to to merge these two streams, it also gives us a negative example. Go go back to to Matthew chapter 2. Come with me to Matthew 2 and listen, because there's also an example of what happens when we're not willing to do this. Listen to chapter 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where's the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That's good news, right? Not for Herod. When Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Why was he disturbed? Well, what we know historically is Herod had spent lots of energy and money trying to convince Israel he was their king. It's why he built them a temple. We also know uh, that it didn't go so well for Herod. What what is this with all Jerusalem? Well, that's the comfortable elite in Jerusalem who rather liked the life the Romans were providing. See, See, Herod, the Jewish establishment, Mary and Joseph, they all had something in common. They all had strong opinions about how life ought to go, about the direction the business ought to go, on what they hoped for and wanted. But where their, part, where their paths, where they split, is Herod and all Jerusalem, I want to suggest to you, that their lives were ruined by their insistence upon a certain outcome. They had every opportunity to merge their understanding with this brand new opportunity, and they said no, and they were ruined by it. Mary and Joseph, on the other hand, I guess I want to suggest they took a deep breath, something we'll talk about in a couple Sundays. 
both literally and figuratively, they caught themselves. They caught themselves in conflict with what they wanted, with what life was giving them. And they merged. They, 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 they must have understood that, that to insist is a very unhealthy place. You don't sleep. You're racked with anxiety. You're lonely. That they must have understood that, that they would have to merge. But it's not one. It's both. You know, I had my own epiphany here this last August. I don't know what caused it. I'm sure a conflict somewhere because one thing control freaks aren't very good at is relationship. And I had this realization of, Adam, you spent the first 36 years of your life believing that life works best when you control its every outcome. And let's be clear, I still basically believe that. It's the doing that is the hard part. And about halfway through my 36 years, I got serious about following Jesus. And I think the difference there was I'm going to control my life uh, to, to, honor, to honor God. But still, the, the belief was the key is this, like make it happen the way you see that it happened. That the question of making, make, making what's outside of me look like what's inside, like what, I'm supposed to, what I think is supposed to happen, that was the goal. And I had this realization, Adam, what if you spent the next 36 years? And what I've come to phrase, what if you've spent the next 36 years merging? What, what if you trusted that there's an alternative that there is a God who draws near and invites you to follow him down an altogether different, if not better, path. Listen, I guess the question that I have for you this morning is, or tonight, excuse me, are you aware of the pain associated with not being willing to merge? Are, are you aware of the, the relational carnage, the, the internal emotional problems, the, the pain. And I don't mean to be patronizing. I understand there's academic and then there was a way we really live. I'm talking about how we really live. Are you living in this reality that merging is what healthy, thriving people do? That there's lots that you control and even more things that you can't. But remember, on, on Christmas, we were given this gift of Jesus the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the significance of which I couldn't possibly do justice to uh, in, in a gathering like this. Who, who could? Savior of all, king of the universe, unlike anyone else who's ever been on the planet. That was the gift of Christmas. But are we also aware that it was made possible by two young, naive, ambitious, idealistic teenagers who also had to adjust their plans? You know, in Matthew... Chapter, chapter 1, listen to 21 again. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save their people from their sins. Tragic, isn't it, the way we've kind of commercialized this word save, like just do this and you'll get to go there when you die, and certainly that's part of it, but certainly not the emphasis. What if the saving is everything we're talking about? A God who draws near and goes, hey, I'd love to lead you down a different path. I'd love to teach you to merge. Listen, if, if this is a conversation that's relevant for you, we, we, we would love to invite you to, to our Sunday gatherings in January. We're going to do a whole series called Merge where we just talk about how do we actually do this. But aside from that, can you imagine what might happen in your relationships if you took seriously this invitation? Can you imagine what might happen in your life, in your emotions, if you could learn to merge what you have to have, what you think must be with what you can't control. Could you imagine what would happen if you had this instant radar where you could differentiate what you can and can't control and you behaved differently based upon which category it fell into? Listen, here, here's maybe my challenge to you. What if tomorrow morning you started the day sitting in a chair, whether you have a relationship with Jesus or not, saying to the God you do or don't even believe is there, God... If you'd like to teach me to merge, let's party. Like, let's, let's do it. I'm here. I, I dare you. Invite him into that conversation. You know, among my favorite things about the Christmas story is that it's similarity to our stories. Two young, ambitious people with deep-seated conviction about their future. It wasn't just about them even faced with an interruption, a disruption they couldn't control. And then Emmanuel, 
a God who draws near and says in a way only he can, can I help? Would you like me to lead you? I'd like to pray and we're, we're going to continue to sing. God, <clears throat> Lord, like so many things that we can wrestle with and think about and learn, there's the intellect and, and the, the academic side of this and then there's the like, he just pulled out in front of me and my business is failing and she just said that and I just stepped on my kid's toy. God, would you, in your grace and by your spirit, God, I I beg you that you would invite our normal patterns and habits, that you would interrupt us and remind us at least once tomorrow of the invitation that you offer of an alternative. A God who says, I'd love to teach you the art of merging. Jesus, We trust you. We love you. And we're so grateful for the chance to celebrate your birthday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online. www.narratechurch.org We would love to hear from you.